The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. All right, uh, I guess I'll get started. So, all right, cool. So, okay, so before I get into any hands, I want to do, this is really loud. All right. Um, before I get to any hands, I wanted to just sort of talk about tournaments versus cash games, since I haven't really made the distinction yet. So essentially, okay, so this is a big chart with all the differences. So when you guys play in the things online, those are called tournaments. So in a tournament, you sort of buy in for a fixed amount of play chips. In this case, it's not that relevant. It's like one play dollar. And then you get uh, for coming in the top... 20% around, you're going to get some amount of uh, play chips paid out to you. And like, if you win, you get the most. Um, and if you just barely make it, you'll probably make back like two play chips. So you'll profit one play chip or something. So that, that's how tournaments work. And that's sort of what throughout this class so far, I've sort of assumed all the, all the hands are taken from tournaments. Um, so there is a different way to play poker, and a lot of you might have actually been introduced to poker like this. You know, so you have like sort of a home game where there's just a bunch of friends, you're playing at someone's house, and you all buy in for some amount of play chips, and basically you can play and you can, people can join and stop any time. They can, if you lose all of your play chips, you can just buy in for more. You don't, it's not like tournaments where once you're out, you're eliminated, and you can never go back into that tournament. Um, in cash games, you can buy in whenever, you know, you can like hit and run people, you can come and try to make a bit of money and then just leave as soon as you make a bit. Um, so, so okay, so what, what are the main differences? So I sort of wanted to highlight the differences between the two types of games and talk about why we mostly choose tournaments in this class. So, okay, so everyone knows the definition of like what, what a tournament is, what a cash game is. Uh, so, okay, so let me talk a bit more about um, so what are some differences? So in cash games, usually the stakes are fixed. Um, so usually, you know, it'll say we're playing for like one, one, one play dollar, two play dollars, or something like that. Um, whereas in tournaments, I'm sure as you've noticed, the blinds keep going up, right? The blinds start 10, 20 in your tournaments, and then they become 20, 40, and then like 40, 80, or 30, 60, I think there's, actually there's a 15, 30 level, I think. So it's 15, 30, and then 20, 40, and then 25, 50, and, and it keeps going up, right? So. And the reason this is the case is so that eventually the tournament ends. Because if the blinds don't go up, the tournament will take forever to end. Um, all right, so what's a big factor about tournaments versus cash games? Is in tournaments, you have no control over your table. You just join the tournament, and you're put at some table, and you just got to do your best at the table you're placed at. And the fact that there's not this much metagaming, I think, is one of the reasons it's much easier to analyze poker hands in, in terms of tournaments. Because in cash games, you know, if you're at the cash game and everyone's really, really good, you could just choose, I don't want to play in this cash game anymore. I'm just losing my money. And you could choose to stand up and leave. And there's a lot of decisions of this form. So, and so, so it's, it's, there is more metagaming required. Um, and in tournaments, the general goal is to survive. Right? You're just trying to get eliminated as late as possible to maximize your payout. Whereas in cash games, a lot of it comes down to, you know, if there's one bad player at the table, you're trying to target that specific player. You're trying to do everything you can to get in hands against that player and exploit them and win a lot of money against them and risk a lot and stuff like that. So, um, and, and yeah, so, so there, there's less focus on the math of poker and more focus on specifically targeting certain players. Uh, tournaments, there's frequent but fixed losses. So, you know, so if we were playing tournaments for real money, how it works is, you know, most of the time, right, like 80% of players don't get paid anything back from the tournament. So when you play tournaments, most of the time you're going to lose. Even if you're really good, you're not going to win more than 50% of the time. So you're going to lose, 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 and then you're going to get a big win and then win a lot. And then it's going to be lose, 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 and you're going to win a lot, right? It's sort of like playing the lottery. Um, whereas cash games, Anything can happen. You can lose a lot. If you're having a bad day and you decide not to quit, you could lose all your money, buy back in, lose all your money, buy back in, eventually lose all the money in your bank account, right? That could happen. Um, you could also win a lot. So anything can happen. Um, but in some sense, tournaments is more variance. So like when I was talking in the first class about the law of large numbers and reaching the long run, it does overall, in some sense, take longer if you're playing tournaments. 
um, because in tournaments, it's you do need to occasionally get the big score in the tournament. It's like sort of like winning a lottery to to make back all your money. And if you don't, then you won't make back all your money. Um, yeah, I, I argue that tournaments I think are more fun. There's they're more exciting. If you make it far in a tournament, you know, eventually it comes down to just two of you. It's, it's pretty exciting. I uh, also tournaments have a wider range of situations. So in cash games, you know, usually it'll be a fixed number of players at the table and players will have a similar number of big blinds because whenever you lose a bunch of big blinds, you can always just buy back in and get those big blinds back by putting more money on the table. Whereas in tournaments, we have to learn how to handle, I think, interesting mathematical situations where you have like one big blind. How do I play it optimally? And stuff like that. Um, the last thing is if you play at a casino, though, one, another good thing about tournaments is relatively the casino makes a lot less from tournaments and cash games. Cash games, just as a fraction of how much money you wager, the, the casino takes way more compared to tournaments. Um, tournaments, what the casino, what the house takes is very small. Okay, so, so those are sort of the main differences, but I did want to sort of uh, comprehensively go through the differences because, you know, if you do decide to play poker, these are the two, essentially the two ways to play it. So I wanted to make sure everyone was well aware of these, the differences. Um, so, yeah, so why, why I chose tournaments for the class, I think it's, there's less metagaming, I think it's more exciting. I'm mostly a tournament player myself, although I have played cash for, cash games for extended periods during my career. Um, yeah, there's a wider range of scenarios, and I think it's more applicable. I think, um, you know, like the MIT Poker Club, I, the, the event they're running in January is a tournament, because tournaments are exciting. Um, okay, so are, are there any questions about this chart? Okay, cool, okay. So, yeah, so our club actually has both. I mean, for the points, only tournaments count, but if you look at this, uh, this thing above, then uh, I should think the pen works now. Oh no, I have to draw on here. Okay, so yeah, if you if you look there, then these are the cash tables, and you could in theory sit down there and play for play money. And if you do lose all your play money in those cash tables to a shark in the class, and you have no more play money and you can't join tournaments, you can always refill your play money and join the tournaments. So that's why it's called play money. Um, okay, so. But yeah, only tournaments count for standings, and if you want to see the standings, you have to, um, you have to, oh, I see, the annotate, I gotta click. So, so yeah, you see the, you gotta click the blue arrow, and then you can see the standings. Some people ask me about this, so if you want to see your standings, how many points everyone has, how many points you have, you can click that, you can click there. Okay, all right, so let's get into some poker hands now. Um, you know, that being said, I highlighted all these differences about cash games and tournaments, but good poker is essentially good poker. Like, if you're good at one, you're probably good at the other. The difference is still rather small. It's more based on, like, you know, how much risk do I want to take? What kind of schedule do I want to play on? That determines which one you choose to play, rather than, like, am I better at tournaments or cash games? Like, at least once you're, uh, except at the very top levels, there, you know, there really is no difference between, like, there's no such thing as a cash game specialist, except at the very, very top, where it's possible your, the, the best cash game players are, are good at cash games compared to the best tournament players. But, like, when you're just starting out, if you're good at one, you're good at the other, essentially. All right, cool. So, uh, so today I'm going to talk about some pre-flop play. So last class I focused on post-flop play. The first class I talked a bit about what hands you should open with pre-flop, but I didn't really say that much about playing pre-flop. But it's sort of the most one of the most important parts of the hand because it determines what cards you're playing for the rest of the hand. So okay, so. First of all, I wanted to run through sort of some numbers. Um, it's good to have a sense of these. You don't have to memorize all of these, but it's good to have a reasonable idea of equities of specific hands versus specific hands when you get it all in preflop. So, and I sort of classified this to make this roughly easier to memorize. So, okay, so the biggest example, so, so the first example, which is sort of the dream situation, is you have a bigger pair against a smaller pair. Right? What's the best situation that you can be given preflop in poker? It's, so what's the best hand you can have? It's aces, right? But you don't want aces in for everyone else to have 3-2 offsuit because they're just going to fold, right? So you want aces and you want someone else to have kings. Um, one of my screen names was actually, uh, please give me ace ace against king king or something on the site because it, it really is the best situation you can hope for. 
um, because they're going to put all their money in with kings. And you're, so roughly when you have a bigger pair against a smaller pair, you're uh, an 80-20 favorite. So you win four-fifths of the time. Um, and the edge dwindles a bit as you get to like 3-3 versus 2-2 because there's a higher chance both pairs will be counterfeited. Like the board can come 6-6, six, 7-7, six, seven, seven, 8 or something. And then pocket threes ties pocket deuces. Okay, and uh, an equally good situation is one pair against zero over cards. So ace ace against ace king off is also a very good situation. You're actually 93% there because you dominate their ace. So there's very few ways for them to win. Um, pocket aces against 6-5 suited. This is actually the hand that's best against aces other than aces itself. It's 6-5 suited and that's aces is only 77.5%, but it's still you know ludicrous. Uh, so pocket jacks against 10-9 suited, 81.7%. So some rough numbers. You know, 10-9 suited is pretty good, but pocket jacks sort of crushes it because having two jacks blocks a lot of their straight outs. Um, pocket queens against 7-4 off is very good because 7-4 off is not suited, not connected. And the best you can do pre-flop is actually king-king versus king-two off. Um, yeah, if you have pocket kings against king deuce off, I think, I think that's the highest equity you can possibly get it in preflop, uh, is 94.6%. And pocket kings against king two suited is 89 points. So look how much better king two suited does against, than king two off against king king. Um, the fact that you, it's easier to make a flush is so relevant. Um, so we'll talk more about this later. Okay, the next few categories. So one pair against, a pair against one overcard. So you're still a favorite, but less big of a favorite. Instead of an 80-20, you're a 70-30. So queen-queen against ace-jack off is 71.7%. Queen-queen against ace-jack suited is a bit worse. Um, queen-queen against ace-queen suited is actually much worse than queen-queen against ace-jack suited. I think this is a bit counterintuitive at least because so with against ace jack suited I always thought you know they have more outs they can hit three jacks but it actually turns out the fact that they have a queen to prevent you from hitting three of a kind in this situation they've already hit an ace is actually a lot more relevant so 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 yeah so queens is much worse against ace queen than ace jack and yeah pocket eights against ace two off 70 um 70.2 percent Pocket threes against ace two off is a bit worse because once again, small pairs can get counterfeited when you go all in preflop. Okay, um, a similarly good situation, which is a 70-30, is when you're, quote, dominating the other person. So dominating means one of your cards is the same, but the other card is different and yours is higher. Okay, so ace king off against ace queen suited, pretty good situation to get in in poker. You're 70, you're 70%. If you're suited and they're not, then you're 75%. If neither of you are suited, it's 74%. Um, yeah, ace king off versus king queen off, you're, you're actually a bit better. Um, even though king, so ace king off against ace queen off, you're 74.4%. Ace king off versus king queen off, you're 74.8%, and you're a bit better because, because it's harder to tie with the ace. So when you both have an ace, it's possible the board will come with two pairs, and then, so like six, six, seven, seven, eight and then both of you will have two pairs of sixes and sevens with the ace kicker, but that's less likely to happen if they don't have, like if your bottom card is their top card instead of your top card being their top card. Um, one thing to keep in mind is ace five off against ace two off is barely a favorite at all. So it's nowhere near as good as ace queen off against ace jack off. Um, anyone have an idea why that is? Right, exactly. Yeah. So, you, so the five and two are going to get counterfeited. The the five kicker is going to get counterfeited a lot more often because if four cards on the board come that's higher than five, the five is going to be irrelevant. So, so yeah, that that's a good thing to remember. All right. So, let, let's look at some more numbers. Okay, this is one thing that I've always thought is really cool. Two over cards versus a pair is actually very close to a fifty-fifty for the most part. Um, Ace King suited against pocket twos is 49.9%. I actually showed you in the first class, if, if they don't have a two of your suit, then it's actually like 50.1%. So, um, Ace King off versus pocket twos uh, is 47.4%. Note that 10-9 suited against, tw against pocket twos is actually a 54% favorite. Um, it's, it's much better than Ace King against pocket twos because 10-9 can make a lot more straights and flushes, 
And the fact that you know, you're making a pair of tens instead of a pair of aces isn't that relevant, is irrelevant when the thing you're trying to beat is a pair of deuces. Um, Ace-king off versus pocket queens is only 43%. Um, even though people call it a coin flip, it's actually much worse than a coin flip. So, um, yeah, this is actually one of the things that, first things that drew me to Hold'em. When I found this out, I was curious, you know, did, I was wondering, the person who invented the rules of Hold'em, did they invent it so that this is a 50-50, or did, was it just by coincidence that it's about a 50-50? But I think it's very cool that it turns out to be a 50-50. Um, okay, so... Okay, so the last case is, you know, there's some weird cases where all four cards are different. Roughly speaking, when all four cards are different, the, the guy with the highest card is going to be a 60-40. I mean, this is very rough because it's hard to encompass all the different types of scenarios under the same umbrella. But um, roughly, the thing that matters is having the highest card. So, okay, so let's see. So... A, B versus C, D, which means you have two cards above their two cards. Um, you know, you can be as good as 67.7% if it's like ace, king off versus queen, seven off, because queen, seven off has no straight outs and no flush outs. Um, yeah, A, C versus B, D, it's about 60 versus 40. Um, a, D versus B, C, it can be as low as 50-50. So ace, two off against 10, nine suited is only 51.6%. So that's sort of the worst case for uh, for high for like A D versus B C, okay. So you can look through those numbers more on the slides, and you can um, you can also get it yourself on Poker Stove or a lot of websites. You can compute the equities of a hand versus another. But it's good to have some rough ideas of these categories. You know, when is it an eighty twenty? When am I a forty one favorite? When am I a seventy thirty favorite? When am I a fifty fifty? When am I a sixty forty? Okay. So one thing that I hope you sort of got from these numbers is that suitedness matters a lot when you're behind and matters not that much when you're ahead. So if you look at these numbers, the gain in equity of ace king suited when ace king, sorry, the gain of equity of ace king when ace king is suited is only 1%. You only increase your equity from 74.4 to 75.4. Um, but if ace queen is suited, then the equity of ace king drops by 4% instead of 1%, right? And the reason essentially is if your hand is bad, you need as many ways as possible to try to get lucky, and being suited is one of them. But if your hand is already very good, you just really need your opponent to not get lucky. And you being suited is only going to be relevant if they first, you know, they first hit a pair to beat you, and then you need to hit a flush to to beat them. So that's one thing to keep in mind. So like with ace king, the difference between suited and unsuited doesn't matter that much. But with a hand like nine eight. Being suited is way better than being not suited. And suitedness is also important for implied odds, as I talked about last class, because you can make much better decisions post-swap if your hand is suited. Okay, so, um, so okay, yeah, so th that's the roughly some uh, hand equities to remember. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about some pre-flop all-ins. So going all-in pre-flop. So, okay, so this class, most of this class, okay, this is going to be a bit boring, maybe. These are not really highlight real plays, and, you know, th these, this is about, like, routine making good decisions that increase your preflop equity by a couple of percent that will, but it's really these boring decisions, I think, that make your win rate, not the occasional brilliant thing that you see on TV. So, you know, so if your goal is to get on TV, then studying this is maybe pointless. But if your goal is to, you know, make expectancy, win money, essentially, then it's really the simple, boring decisions that affect whether you win, not the one-time crazy bluff you pulled off against Phil Ivey that makes you a winner. So, okay. So, okay, so let's talk about this a bit. So, so the main thing is, one thing is, don't be afraid to go all in preflop. I mean, I didn't really stress this yet, but one thing I tend to see people do is you're too afraid to put all your money in preflop because uh, you would think it's gambling or something, or it's like, you know, it's, it, it is a lot of luck. I mean, you know, you essentially put your tournament life, you let it ride on a coin flip. So it does seem scary. Um, but the things to remember essentially is when late in the tournament, the antis and blinds are so big, and if you ever can win the blinds by going all in, that's such a large gain relative to what you risk. And also just any two cards have a chance against any other two preflop. So what was the rule I said? So the rule I said in the first class is when the effective stack size is less than 12 big blinds, when there's antis, then just go all in if you're going to play the hand at all. 
And if there's no antes, then you need to be a bit you need to be a bit um, shorter because you don't want to risk 12 big blinds when there's no antes. So you only want to risk like 10 big blinds without antes. But this was the rule that I outlined in the first class, roughly, on when you can go on. And um, one thing I wanted to talk about too before we get to the first example is this from the small blind. So in the first class, I said your button opening range is similar to your small blind opening range. And why was this? Even though from the small blind, right? So it's when it's folded to, to you in the small blind, you only have to get through one more player. Whereas when it's folded to you on the button, you need to get through two more players. So it seems like you could play a lot more hands from the small blind. And another advantage of playing from the small blind is you've already put in half a blind. So the amount you gotta put in, the amount more you gotta put in to play the pot is less, is half a blind less. But we said that being in position, right? Especially we saw this last class. Being in position is so important that the fact that you're in position on the button and not in position on the small blind meant about balanced out the advantages of playing hands from the small blind. So we said, you know, roughly speaking, you should be similarly willing to, to raise hands from the button and ra raise hands from the small blind. Um, but for all ends, Position doesn't matter, right? If all the money goes in the pot pre-flop, then who gets to act last post-flop doesn't matter because there's no more actions to make post-flop. So for all ends, your small blind all in range can be a lot wider than your button all in range. And furthermore, I think the threshold of how many bets you can have to go all in is a lot higher because even with like 15, even with 20 big blinds, I often go all in from the small blind if I know the big blind's a competent player because from the button, I would pretty much very rarely go on for 20 big blinds because I'm not that sad if I just raise it to 2.25 and let them call because I get to play the rest of the hand in position. But from the small blind, when I know that if they call, I'm playing the hand out of position, I really want to avoid this situation. So going all in for a huge amount from the small blind is usually okay since there's only one player behind anyway. Okay, so. So, okay, so let's look at a sample situation and I'm gonna first analyze it theoretically and then I'll try to go through a bunch of examples. So, okay. So do we go all in or fold here? And let's suppose we're reasoning exploitatively, <coughs> right? So this was uh, level two thinking, not level three thinking. So if we're reasoning exploitatively, what we're asking ourselves is essentially, right, what's exploitative thinking? We put our opponent, we model our opponent give them a probability distribution, and then play in a way that maximizes our expectation relative to the Bayesian uh, probability distribution we put on our opponent. So, you know, we can ask yourself, is the big blind a gambly player? Is it likely he or she will call with a wide range of hands? How crazy have I been playing? You know, will he give me any credit if I go all in? Um, suppose the pay, pay bubble doesn't matter. So suppose it's far from, you know, having to try to survive to make the next pay increase or whatever. So, okay, so let's, so, so let's do this. What do we think he's calling? Um, okay, so this, okay, so I want to see what the, what you guys think. So does someone want to give me a hand that you think he's calling or de definitely calling or definitely not calling? You, you can give me a no brainer. I just want people to. Someone's uh, so, okay. So what's the hand he's obviously not calling? Okay, good. Two seven offsuit. What's the hand he's obviously calling? Okay, good. Pocket aces. Okay, so let, let's try to zero in a bit more. Okay, so let's. Um, okay, don't don't worry. So okay, so tell me what hands you think he might be calling that are a bit worse than pocket aces. What okay? What do you think he he is the smallest pocket pair he's calling? Or what, okay, let's, if you're not sure, let me ask you, what's the smallest pocket pair you would call if you don't know anything about the small blind? So it's, it's 15 big blinds. It, it's a 15 big blind all one. Um, okay, who would call pocket fives? Okay, who would call, call pocket twos? Okay, um, who would call uh, ace seven suited? Okay, who would call uh, Queen Jack offsuit? Okay, um, okay, so uh, okay, so I guess we have a rough idea of okay. So since assuming you're playing at someone in this class, so let's just say we look at that sample to sort of have, guess what they're calling. So okay, so I had this range. Uh, maybe it's a bit and more ambitious than what people put up their hands for. So I, I said they would call with any pocket pair 
any ace, um, king 10 offsuit, king 8 suited. So this is what I said they would call with, which is 25% of hands. Um, okay, so maybe in reality they call with even less. Maybe in reality they only call 20%, 15% of hands. But, but this just further emphasizes my point. So, um, okay, so, so we assume they call 25%, let's say. Okay, so let's do the math. Let's now assume we have 10-8 offsuit. Okay, so let's do the math against this. Um, oh, sorry. So what is the equity of 10-8 offsuit against their 25% range? So when we get called, we're not doing so well because they're only calling 25% of hands. So their hand is going to be good when they call. Um, we're only 36%. Okay, so let's do the math. So 75% of the time they're going to fold and we're going to win 2.5 big blinds, right? Why is it 2.5 big blinds? It's it's there's the, there's a the big blind that we're winning right there's a small blind that we're winning and then there's um, there's the one big blind from the antes that we're winning right and, and it's 2.5 we count the small blind because even though we put in the small blind the fact that you put it in the pot it doesn't matter who put it in the pot the fact that it's already in the pot means we're winning the money right that makes sense okay so 25% of the time he's gonna call. And then when this happens, 36% of the time, we're going to win the all-in, and we're going to win 16.5 big blinds, because we're going to win the 1.5, we're going to win the small blind, the antis, plus his entire 15 big blind stack. 64% of the time, we're going to lose, and we're going to lose 14 and a half big blinds, is, which is how much we wagered to do this all-in. So you can do the calculation, and we're, it's actually very positive. We're making an expectation, an entire big blind, by going all-in. Okay. So now let's suppose we had a worse hand. Um, so let's suppose we had 3-2 offsuit, okay? Um, we can do the same calculation again. The only thing that changed is now we only have 28% equity instead of 36% equity. Um, so 3-2 offsuit is actually a worse hand than 7-2 offsuit for a lot of all-in purposes because 7-2 offsuit is like the worst poker hand against a range of strong hands, but against a range of any two cards, 3-2 off is actually worse than 7-2 off because 7 high is relevant if they have like 6 high. Um, okay, so the, anyways, so you, so you do the calculation and you find that this is still an excellent play. It's, so going on with 3-2 offsuit is actually not a crazy bad play. It looks like a crazy bad play on paper. And okay, and I'll tell you in reality, it is a crazy bad play, but, um, but according to this calculation, it's actually not a crazy bad play. You're, you're actually earning 0 0.42 big blinds. Okay, so, so what's wrong? What's wrong? Why, is, why does our calculation say 3-2 off is a good play? And there's no mistake in the calculation. It's not because of a mistake in the calculation. Because of the high probability that he's not going to call you? Right, exactly. Okay, good. Yeah, so basically, remember, we did this calculation using level two reasoning, exploitative thinking, right? We built a model for him, and if our model is correct, then actually 3-2 offsuit is a good all-in. But so, so what this is showing us is actually, the point is, if our model is correct, then they're making a mistake. Then, then he's making a mistake by only calling 25% of hands. It's just too small a fraction it's too, full, too small a fraction of hands to call with. So I guess the lesson sort of is, you know, so, so when I took the poll around the class, you guys wanted to call even less than 25%, right? Like 25% still includes ace-2 offsuit and still includes hands like, um, let's see again. It still includes hands like queen, king-10 offsuit, queen-10 suited, king-8 suited. So, um, so, you know, so even 25% is sort of too low in the sense that, it allows the small blind to shove any two cards. Uh, shove means all in. Shove any two cards profitably. Um, and in reality, it might be even lower if people were being truthful when they put up their hand for what they're calling with, right? So, so basically, my point is, I think people are too afraid to go all in preflop. Going all in preflop is um, is fine, basically. Uh, and you know, so let's suppose we're the big blind now, and we're considering adding queen jack off to our calling range. So, you know, so I'm saying, okay, you're making the mistake as a big blind of only calling 25%, but, um, but what's wrong with my reasoning, right? The thing that's wrong with my reasoning is that's only a mistake from a level three reasoning point of view, right? That's only a mistake in that it's not theoretically optimal because in theory, the small blind could shove any two cards profitably, 
But if the small blind isn't actually shoving any two cards, then maybe this is actually the optimal range to call. Like if the small blind is shoving too small, then maybe 25% is the optimal strategy for the big blind from that point of view. So, right, so we can do a calculation with queen jack. So let's assume the small blind only shoves top 25% of hands instead of 100%, then your equity is only 42%, and what equity do we need to call? And uh, we need to call 14 big blinds, right? We need to call 14 big blinds, and if we call, the pot will be 31, so we need 14 over 31, which is about 45% equity. We only, have, we only have 42, so we actually shouldn't call anymore. Um, so, you know, it's possible the big blinds play is correct, but the point is someone's play isn't correct. So, um, so I also wanted this example to give you another idea of what sort of optimal Nash equilibrium play is. So, okay, so I'm going to sort of, so let's draw a chart of um, what is in game theory called like an iterative best response. Okay, so how this works is I fix a strategy for one player, I take the best strategy for the other player at exploiting the strategy. And then I fix that strategy and I come back to, so I fix a strategy for the big blind, which is only called 25% of hands. And then I ask myself, what's the best way for the small blind to exploit this? Well, it's to shove 100% of hands, right, by the calculation. Um, okay, so now, if the small blind is fixed on this strategy, what's the best way for the big blind to exploit this? Well, it's to call with anything, basically, because you know they're shoving anything. So it's to call with a very wide range, say like 67% of hands. And, you know, so once the big, big blind is calling too much, how does the small blind, blind exploit this? Well, now they tighten up, right? They only shove their good hands, and that's fine, because they're getting paid off very often when they shove their good hands. But once the small blind realizes to shove only their good hands, then the big blind's like, oh crap, I shouldn't be calling 67% anymore. I'm going to call less, 30%. So overall, let me draw sort of a diagram of how it's going to work. So, um, okay, so... You can see, right? Zero, a hundred, small blind. Okay, so essentially how it works is, okay, so let me just put some markers. Okay, so how it's gonna start out is the big blind calls 25%, right? Which is here, 25%. And then the small blind to exploit this shoves 100%. Then the big blind goes to call 67%. And then the small blind will respond by shoving 40%. These numbers are approximate, right? Then the small blind will shove too little, and then the big blind will sort of call too little, and then it'll essentially go here, and then go here, uh, and then go here, and, th and then go here. Okay, so essentially the point is, it's going to converge. It's going to zero in on this blue line, okay, on these blue lines. And the thing that it zeroes in on is basically called what's called the Nash equilibrium. So you can actually compute the Nash equilibrium with the computer in this case, um, which is what I did. And this is what the Nash equilibrium is. So the, the optimal thing to do is for the small blind to shove about 66.8% of hands, and the big blind to call about 38.5% of hands. So, um, and I think if you play like, you know, reasonably, like reasonable stakes online poker tournaments nowadays, this is what most people know how to do, because most people will have a, computer program that can do this calculation for them. Um, but it, it's quite loose, essentially. Um, for, so remember, the situation was 15 big blinds, there are antes, and you're in the small blind. You should be shoving two-thirds of hands, roughly. And the big blind should be calling almost 40% of hands. And this is, this is the ranges. And as you can see, the small blind can shove four, three suited. So suitedness is very important. But if your hand is unsuited, then... Um, 7-6 offsuit is a shove, but, oh, 6-5 offsuit is a shove too, but like 9-5 offsuit is not a shove because it says 9-6 off plus, which means 9-5 off is not a shove. So, okay, so it's, so it's always a, a good idea to know the Nash ranges for preflop because even if you're trying to exploit your opponent, you want to make sure you're never going too far off from the optimal play because whenever you get too far off, you could potentially be getting ex exploited. And... So, yeah, but I mean, you don't have to do exactly this. I'm not saying everyone should do exactly this, right? If you think you're smarter than your opponent and you have a good model than your opponent, like if you think the big blind is calling way fewer than 38.5% of hands, then you can go in with a lot more than 66.8% of hands. 
Just make sure if you do decide to try to exploit your opponent, you do the exploitation in the right direction. Um, like if they're calling too little, then you need to shove a lot. If they're calling too much, then you need to shove very little. That makes sense every, with, to everyone, right? That's the, that's the right direction to exploit your opponent. And similarly, if the opponent is shoving too much, then you're going to call a lot. And if they're shoving too little, then you, then you call very little as well. Um, okay. But yeah, but what's good about the Nash equilibrium strategy is you know you can't be exploited. You know no matter what they do. The optimal, basically, the reason why this is, this is called the convergence point is be because if the small blind is shoving 66.8%, the best for the big blind to do against that is 38.5%. And the best to shove against 38.5% calling range is 66.8%. So it essentially converges. Um, that's why it's called an equilibrium. So, so hopefully this gives you a better... Uh, a more concrete example for those of you who haven't seen like what a Nash equilibrium is exactly um, of what I mean by like optimal level three reasoning play. Okay, so that's enough of that. Okay, so now let's go do some concrete ranges. So okay, so now you can ask me, you know, how do we learn these ranges, right? I showed you the Nash range for one specific situation, but right, the situations you can you can enumerate. There's going to be a lot, right? So I showed you the range for small blind versus big blind. And there's 15 big blinds, right? But what if it's 14 big blinds? What if it's 13 big blinds, right? What if it's 10 big blinds with no ante? Um, so essentially, it's a combination of memorization, understanding theory, and then like extrapolation slash interpolation. So, okay, so let me just show you a few more. We can just, so just to give you a rough idea, this is where the memorization slash interpolation comes in. Because if you have a few baselines to go off of, you can sort of um, you can sort of use rules that theoretically make sense to extrapolate. Right? So here's button 10 big blinds. 43.9%, um, and this is roughly the hands. Uh, oh sorry, does is it clear what this range of hands means? I guess I never really explained. Um, basically like uh, S means suited, O means offsuit, and plus just means any hand that where like the denominations are strictly higher. Uh, if you don't know exactly what it means, it's not a huge deal. But uh, but roughly, uh, but roughly, you you want to sort of know what this is like what this is saying. So there's a few weird cases, but roughly, you know, if it says ace x plus, that means any ace, any hand with an ace, suited or unsuited, you can go on. Um, so okay, so forty three point nine percent. Okay, so right, so in terms of extrapolation and interpolation, let's just make sure everyone gets the directions right. So if I move from button to the cutoff, does the per, does the fraction of hands go up or down? Down. Down, right? Um, so the fraction of hands goes down because from the cutoff, there's more players to get through, right? So you you need a better hand. You can't, right? So, so the fraction of hands you can shove goes down, right? That makes sense, to everyone. So make sure you get the direction right. Um, so, okay, and then what if the number of big blinds goes up or down? So let's say it's, let's say it's 15 big blinds. Um, I guess 15 is sort of too much to go all in with. But let's say it's, okay, let's say it's 12 big blinds. Does someone have a guess what the percentage might be? It, it, you just have to get the direction right. What, someone, yeah. 40. Yeah, okay, yeah, 40%. That, that's about right. Yeah, that's about right, basically. So it go, it, the, the percentage will go down a bit. And what if you only have five big blinds? Does someone want to say, guess the percentage? 60. 60, yeah, that's about right. Okay. So yeah, so try to get the, try to get the directions right. If you have a few baseline points and if, you, and if you can get the directions right, that's a very important first step. Um, okay, so here's another data point. Uh, cut off seven big blinds. Um, it's 38.8%. So notice that the cutoff, this situation compared to the first one, you're one position worse because you're cut off instead of button, but you're risking a lot less. You only have seven big blinds, but the percentage is still going down. So I think I said this first class as well. The position matters a lot more than the number of big blinds because for the number of big blinds, even though you're in some sense risking a lot more as you have more big blinds, it's also harder to get called. If I go all in for 10 big blinds, they're going to fold a lot more than if I go all in for seven big blinds. So that's why the position actually matters a lot more than how many bets. Okay, so low jack, so that's high jack minus one, so that's two over from the cutoff. It's only 20, 10 big blinds is only 23.4%. Um, 
but it's still nothing, not nothing. So under the gun, nine-handed, with three big blinds, it's actually pretty high. It's 24.1%. Okay. Uh, so you can go look at those on your own. You can also calculate on your own in certain websites. And uh, yeah, so this will roughly give you an idea of the shape of the graph. So this is under the gun all ins. It's a bit approximated, but with 15 big blinds, I know I recommended with 15 big blinds not to go all in, and I think that's a good recommendation, but let's say you told the computer they were forced to go all in with 15 big blinds and they had to calculate the Nash equilibrium. This is what it would spit out. It would say you go all in with these, this 6.2%, and with 10 big blinds, it's 13.4. With five big blinds, it's 33.3. .3. So it actually increases quite a lot um, for, for under the gun. For under the gun, the amount of, uh, the fraction of hands you can wager as a function of how many big blinds actually goes up quite a lot. Question? Yeah. For example, if you're, uh, you have 15 big blinds and you get an ace, uh, ace uh, jack off suited, mm -hmm. uh, what would be, like, by how much would you raise? Oh, I would raise to like two big blinds or 2.25 big blinds. That's it, very little? Yeah, yeah. There is, uh, for all hands, I essentially raise to 2.25 big blinds. So it goes from 2.25 big blinds to all in. So right, there's yes. There's no middle range. Right, right. There's no in between. Yeah. So the reason essentially is um, there's, okay, so let's say you raise to five big blinds, right? The, this is essentially equivalent to an all in, except worse. So why is it equivalent to an all in? Because if your opponent has pocket aces, or like a good hand, not necessarily pocket aces, they're going to go all in, and pretty much you, ha you have to call. I mean, okay, if you knew they had exactly pocket aces, you could fold, but it's possible for them to play a balanced strategy where they could have pocket aces, or ace king, or pocket tens, or, or whatever, and you're forced to call anyway. So essentially, if you make it any more than 2.25 big blinds, you put in enough chips that your opponent can just play a strategy that forces you to go all in when they want to. And so it's basically strictly worse than just going all in yourself. Yeah. Okay, yeah, good question. Um, but, uh, but yeah, with 15 big blinds, I would recommend just raising small, although I don't think going all in is the end of the world. Uh, yeah, okay, so this is roughly what the shape of the curve looks like. So here's another example. Um, so for, for hijack, from 15 big blinds to 10 big blinds, it actually changes very little. Uh, I guess it changes somewhat, but 23.4% to 28%. And then with five big blinds, it goes up very fast. So as the number of big blinds goes down, it increases a lot. But the difference, but the change from 15 to 10 isn't that much. I guess under the gun, it's a lot. But for hijack, it's not that much. So just give you just give you some ideas. You know, I don't expect everyone to do this perfectly. I, I'm trying. I gave you a bit, a bit of data points. Just try your best to do extrapolate a lot. To try your best to extrapolate slash interpolate. Um, you know, if you if you're off by a lot, that's fine. The biggest thing is just try not to get the direction wrong. You know, like don't think if I have if I'm one position worse, I can shove more hands or something. So, um, okay, a few more pointers about going all in preflop. So here, this is definitely a good play, I think. So you have pocket fours from hijack. You have 15 big blinds, which is more than what I said you should go all in with. But I think, but going on is a good play instead of just raising to two two times the big blind, because small pairs, while having good implied odds when, when very deep. Um, so in the last class, I talked about set mining. I said small pairs are great when you have like 100 big blinds, because you can try to hit three of a kind and just win a massive amount of money when you do. But they actually have terrible implied odds when it's like 20 big blinds deep, because because you only hit three of a kind one eighth of the time. When you do, the total effective stack size is not enough for you to recoup your losses. And when you don't, you're just always going to be sitting there with a pair of fours, and there's always going to be higher cards on the board. It's going to be like ace, jack, ten, and you're always playing a guessing game. Does my opponent have a better pair? And you just can't make good decisions. So, so that's why with small, with small pairs, just going all in, even for a lot of big blinds, is reasonable. Um, so yeah, here's another example. Queen eight suited. You normally you wouldn't go all in with that. You you normally would just fold under the gun if you had a lot of chips. But with only five big blinds, going all in is fine. Um, another factor that's actually sort of relevant here is th this is sort of a, a higher level thing, but it's good to keep in mind is when you're under the gun. In some sense, you have the least to lose by busting the tournament. So. 
by going all in, you're risking busting the tournament. But so this is not true in a cash game. But in a tournament, it's true. Uh, you want to go all in from under the gun when you're really, really short. Um, you have very little lose to lose by busting the tournament because if you don't bust the tournament, the next hand you're, you're the big blind, which really, really sucks. So even though you busted the tournament, you busted the tournament in a situation where the next hand you would have had to pay the blind, which is one fifth of your stack in this case. So going on is okay. Um, Ace two suited is another example of a hand that's pretty good to go all in with because. If they have a better ace, you're still suited, so you have chances of catching up. And the fact that you you remove an ace, like there's less aces out there for them to have, is is quite relevant actually. Um, the fact that there's three aces out there for them to make a good hand to call you with, and them being four. Um, everyone know what I mean by that? So if you have an ace, there's one less ace out there to go around. Um, yeah, so we go I'll go all in here. Okay. Um, and yeah, here we have. 17 and a half big blinds from the button, but I think going all in with ace four off is fine basically. So it's a lot. It's 17 and a 17 and a half big blinds, but once again, ace x offsuit is has terrible implied odds. Um, it also like protects your small pair shoves a bit. So uh, so you know when I said this pocket two's hand, this sorry this pocket four's hand, I said you can go all in for 15 big blinds. But what's one problem if you follow the strategy exactly? It's whenever you do this, your opponent knows you have like pocket twos or pocket threes, right? Then like what can they do? They can like call with 10 nine suited, which is not a good hand. Like 10 high against a 15 big blind shove shouldn't be possible, but they can. So if you also do this with like ace x, it protects, protects you a bit. Um, yeah, with seven six suited, I think it's also okay. This is a similar story to pocket deuces. Um, seven six suited has great implied odds when you're like a hundred bets deep and making straights and flushes is very relevant. But um, when you're only twenty bets deep and you're just trying to make a big pair, essentially, small cards just aren't good at making big pairs. Can't make big pairs. So um, once again, going on is acceptable. Okay. Uh, so oh yeah, one thing to watch out for is I actually swept this under the rug in the last couple of slides. But in all these cases I showed you, there's actually a pretty big disincentive to go all in. Um, does anyone see what it is by, by looking at the stack sizes? So, so they've always been the same, actually. But does someone see a pretty big disincentive? Uh, yeah, Vincent. Other people have much larger stacks than you. Uh, right. Although, actually, I should say this. Other people having much larger stacks than you is actually an incentive to go all in. Um, the reason being... It's it's possible, like let's say you go all in, and then someone calls, and then another guy like re-raises all in, and the first guy who called folded, then what would happen is you're still all in, and if you win the pot, you now triple up instead of double up, and you still only have to beat one hand. Did, did, did that make sense, everyone? I can draw it out if it didn't make sense. So like so you you go all in for fifty four hundred. So let's say this guy calls for fifty four hundred. Uh, let me use a different color. This guy calls for 5,400. And then let's say this guy goes all in for 12,000. And then this guy folds, which he shouldn't be doing because he definitely has odds to call, but let's say he does fold. Then the situation is great because how the rules work is now the pot, so now he, this guy is going to get back um, 6,600. And the pot, but, but 5,400 of his is still in the middle. And essentially, there's this 5400, this 5400, and your 5400, and you're only against his hand. And if you win, you get all the money. So, so you actually triple up instead of double up. So that's actually a good incentive. Um, but, but yeah, that's a good observation. So, yeah. So, like, because you're going all in is profitable because there's a high probability of other people folding. But if like two people call or three people call, you get. Uh, like a lot of people can call, and then your your odds are not very good when they call. Right, right. So yeah, that is relevant. Yeah, so multiple people can call, but uh, the Nash ranges that I presented do take that into account. So um, like the Nash ranges, the Nash calculations do take into account that multiple people can call. Um, you have to look carefully at the stack sizes. Uh, yeah. Dave Lyon only have 2100. Right, good, good. Uh, uh, damn, I wish I brought one of those gift certificates. Okay, um, I still have some, but okay. So, right, so this is actually very relevant, and I swept this under the rug, but uh, let me clear the annotation. 
If a big blind only has four bets, only has four big blinds in this situation, um, and they're basically guaranteed to call. You know, that's not a terrible result for you because there's a good chance they just have absolute trash and queen seven suited is better than them, but it's still worse than being able to steal the big blind for free. So the fact that the big blind is so short here that they're basically almost guaranteed to call, maybe they'll fold like 3-2 offsuit, is really, really bad for you because your chances of just winning down the, taking down the blinds without having to win an all-in is a lot lower. Does that make sense to everyone? So, uh, so it's hard to do when you're just starting out, but it's good to pay attention to all the different stack sizes. And if there's someone behind, like someone in the blinds who's very short and who's almost guaranteed to go all in, then you should be a lot, lot less incentivized to try to steal the blinds. Um, yeah. Okay. All right, guys, I'm going to get started again. All right, so... Uh, Okay, so I'm going to give you a few more. Going to give you a few more examples of sort of extrapolation. I know this is a bit boring, but to be honest, I think you know this is less exciting than you know playing post flop and reading your opponent and trying to like read what cards they have and trying to make tricky bluffs. But really, in in tournaments, the, the best skill you can have when just learning, just starting out, is knowing when to go all in. Because if you you know even if you're pretty good at it versus very good at it. The fact that because most hands just come down to going all in preflop, if you can increase your like equity every time you do this by like even one percent, that's a huge you know that's a huge gain in terms of how profitable of a player you'll be. So so yeah, it, it's a bit boring, but you, just try to bear with me. This is like the most important skill in tournaments, essentially. Um, okay, so. I wrote down on this graph sort of the most number of big blinds I'm willing to risk all in from for all in for from each position. So I want to sort of illustrate a concept. These numbers are actually quite ambitious, by the way. Um, I think I made this maybe four years ago when I was trying to play exploitatively against the fact that the average player was too tight. The average player was not willing to call often enough. Um, so you would be able to shove more hands than Nash because most players don't call enough. Nowadays, I think people are getting closer to Nash, so you can't really be this ambitious anymore. Like all these numbers should go down a bit. You shouldn't be going on for that many bets. But nonetheless, I'm, the the graphs illustrate the same point. So I roughly so I wrote down in black how many bets I'm willing to risk from each position uh, with Ace Four offsuit. So notice that from the button, it's huge. It's 22. But under the gun, it's a lot smaller. It's only seven, and roughly, um, roughly, it decreases as like as like a one over x curve, as like a inverse curve, and that's sort of intuitive because you know, if you shove from the button, you need to be like the best out of third ha three hands, so it's like one over three, and then you got to be the best out of four, so it's like one over four, and then one over five, one over six, etc. So, so the graph is roughly, I mean, I don't know, let's say eighty eight over number of hands remaining, or I, I don't know, something like that. Um, but, okay, but I want to show you a similar curve with 7-6 suited. Um, so, okay, what do you notice about these two curves? It's much more linear than the other one. Right, so this, this one is very curved. This one is like 1 over x. I, I mean, this one is maybe there's like a, okay, this one, it's a lot flatter, right? It's 9.5 under the gun, which is more than 7.7 7 for ace-4, but Ace four, it's uh, Ace four, it's it's twenty two from the button. Whereas for seven six, it's only nineteen. Um, so the the thing is, these two hands are a bit different. So with essentially with Ace four off, there it's actually like it's a hand that does poorly against good hands, but well against bad hands. Because against a bad hand, your Ace high is going to be good, and against a good hand, you're always going to be dominated. Like if they call with an ace jack or like a pair of sevens, you're going to be a 30 70, right? Whereas with seven six, even if they have aces, you're it's I mean, it's bad, but like it's the best hand against aces. But basically, seven six, you're going to be better on average. You know, if they call with ace king, it's not a good situation, but it's much better than if you had ace four. Um, whereas you, whereas um, if they have like eight two offsuit, which is a terrible hand, that actually theoretically is ahead of yours. So What's the most important thing about 7-6 suited when going on with it? Essentially, it's having a lot of chips. It's having a large stack. 
because you just really want to you you want them to fold all their trash hands, and it's good when they're not going to call you very often. So you want to have a lot of bets. Whereas for Ace Four, the most important thing is you know you don't mind if they call as long as they call with a bad hand. So the most important thing you want with Ace Four is you want to have you want to be later in position so that you're against fewer hands, so that there's a less of a chance that someone behind is going to pick up Ace Jack or pocket tens. So. When you're extrapolating slash interpolating, try to remember this principle. So yeah, so with like a suited connector hand, it matters a lot more how many bets you have. You um, whereas with with like a hand with two unsuited but sort of big cards like Ace Four offsuit, King Eight offsuit, Queen I guess Queen Seven offsuit or whatever, the thing that matters most is having few players left to act behind. Okay. Uh, okay, so I talked a lot about how to initiate all-ins from preflop. Uh, so what about calling other people's all-ins? Uh, so okay, so yeah, so one other, so another thing that I sometimes see people do is fold with ridiculously good odds preflop. Um, and similarly, how you can shove any two cards preflop, you can also call a lot preflop because you'll always have some equity. Um, so yeah, it's difficult to have less than 30% equity preflop, no matter what your cards are, unless your opponent is like has a really strong range, like they're really tight and you know they have like jacks plus an ace king or something. Uh, it's difficult to have less than 30% equity if you have an ace in your hand, right? Because I because if you have an ace, then you're either gonna have an overcard at least to their pair or be dominated, but both of those are still 3070s. Only if they have aces are you actually in really bad situation. Um, so, okay, so I just wanted to show you a hand here that looks maybe a bit like bad play to some of you, but I think it's very reasonable, reasonable play. So, okay, so we have 9-8 suited, we have 15 big blinds, so we don't go all in, right? Which is fine, we make it 1600. And then it's folded to the big blind, but the big blind goes all in uh, for 10 big blinds, for, for, t for 10 big blinds. So. So, you know, so normally, if the big blind had covered us, if they had 15 big blinds, you would probably fold this because you have nine high. Um, you probably you, you don't have enough odds to call. But in this specific case, the effective stack size is not 15 big blinds, right? They only have 10 big blinds, so the effective stack size is 10 big blinds. So if you do the math, when the effective stack size is only um, 10 big blinds, you basically you have enough equity to call. Um, like even if they had 12 big blinds, maybe it's very borderline. But if, even if they have 12 big blinds, roughly speaking, you have enough equity to call, right? This is sort of the same calculation as me saying, if you have 12 or less big blinds and you raise and someone goes all in, you basically have to call. This is sort of a similar calculation. It's, it's the same thing. You raise, someone went all in, the, it's effectively 12 big blinds, and you can call. So this is a totally reasonable play, and then you just call, OK? Um, if you do the math, you need 37% equity to call. It's possible in some like corner cases you can convince yourself that you don't have 37% equity. But for the most part, I see a lot more of like bigger mistakes by people folding this spot. Like if you call, you're never really making a huge mistake. Okay, fine. If they're like sort of tight, maybe you only had 35% equity and you and you needed 37, you made a small mistake. But there are situations similar to this where you might have like 45% equity and you only need 37% equity. So it's a huge mistake. Um, folding can be a big mistake, but calling is rarely like a huge mistake when it's 12 big blinds or less. So yeah, so any hand that we would raise here in the first place, we probably would have enough equity to call. Like, you know, if I had 7-2 offsuit here, I probably would not call, but I would not raise here with 7-2 offsuit. So any hand that you would have chosen to open here, which is about like 30% of hands or 25% of hands, uh, I think you can call. Okay, uh, here's another situation that we sort of talked about already. You have four big blinds and you have to pay a big blind. Basically, you pretty much have to play close to any two cards in this spot. Um, if you do the calculation, right, you only need to call, I mean, calling is equivalent to going all in, sort of. Like, if you go all in, you know you're getting called because they're going to have, um, they're going to have almost 41 odds, which is, so they're going to call. Um, so essentially, the calculation is, do I want to wager my entire stack on this hand? And you're risking three big blinds for a total pot of nine and a half big blinds. So 
essentially you only need 30% equity to call. And 30% equity is very easy to have free flop essentially. So um, yeah, so basically you have to play any two cards. Queen eight off is way more than good enough. Um, yeah, so this is basically the calculation I just went through. And yeah, like here I think I would probably play 95% of hands. I think I'll fold like 3-2 offsuit, 4-2 offsuit, but I'll probably play any hand with a card that's like 10 or higher, and I'll probably play every suited hand. Um, okay, so let's talk a bit about re-raising all in preflop now. So in all the situations I showed you where we're just about going all in and someone calling preflop, um, so yeah, so oh yeah, so okay, so I wanted to show you know, so yeah, don't do this, don't call preflop. I already talked about this, but especially when you have ten big blinds, don't. So once again, here, don't just raise when you only have ten big blinds. If that's less than twelve, so you can go all in. Um, yeah, so you basically either want to go all in or fold. Um, so, but I want to start talking about raising now. So okay, so why is this so bad? But. This is okay when we have more big blinds. So now we have everyone has uh, everyone has uh, 19, 19 and a half big blinds. So why is this okay? The main reason is because um, so in the first case, right? So I talked about this. If you get caught, if someone goes all in, you basically you have to call anyway. So you might as well go all in yourself because you're not getting away if they pick up a good hand. Uh, so that's the same calculation. Um, Okay, I'm just going to skip that part. It's, it's the same calculation. Essentially, it's just saying there's there's no point to not go all in because if someone else goes on, we're gonna we're essentially roped into calling anyway. So the second case, we can get out. We can fold. Okay, so let's keep this in mind, right? So in this case, we can definitely fold. So so we can do the calculation. Um, in this case, we need to call 17 big blinds to win a total pot of 40.5. We need 42% equity, and we almost certainly don't have this because we raised from early position. They went all in against an early position raise, so they probably have a good hand. Um, we're almost certainly going to be a 30-70. Okay. So, yeah, so, so let's look at whether we call or re-raise. So, for re-raise sizing, okay, so now let's put ourselves in his shoes. If he's re-raising, sort of the same principles apply when you're re-raising. So the advantage of re-raising to a small size is that, you know, what if it's deep enough where he could re-raise and we could, we could like, four bet, go re-raise again and go all in. Then they could fold if they were intending to do that. Um, the advantage of re-raising to a large size is you deny your opponent the odds to call profitably. And once again, if, you, if your re-raise size would cause you to commit a critical portion of your stack such that you can't escape, you're going to go all in anyway, then you might as well just re-raise all in. So it's essentially the same principles, but uh, let's see this in action. So, uh, so, so yeah. Let's, so this is what you don't want to do. Um, and I see some players doing this, which is fine because I've never really explained this in class. But if someone raises, let's say to two thousand, you don't really want to just click the raise button. This is what would happen to, if you click the raise button because he raised twelve hundred from eight hundred to two thousand. So if you click the raise button, this is the minimum amount you can raise. You can raise it to two thousand plus twelve hundred. But if you look at the odds they're giving him, it's actually ludicrous, right? They have to call 1,200. Uh, so they have to they have to call 1,200, and the pot will be the pot will be 550,264, uh, essentially 7,200. So yeah, so it's 61, right? They got to call 1,200 into a pot of uh, 7,200. So this size is basically way too small. So how big do you want to make it? Um, so roughly speaking, you want to make it. Uh, 2.5 times they're open. I think that's a reasonable rule. If there, there, I mean, there's a lot of factors that can affect this, but if you're not sure what to do, a reasonable rule for re-raising preflop is 2.5 times what the original guy raised. If you're out of position, you might want to raise a bit more because there's more incentive for them to call if they can play in position post flop. But um, but I think in this specific spot, this 5,000 is a good size. Okay. Uh, I'm going to skip this slide. So, uh, but in this case, actually, so uh, can we see our stack size? Okay, so our stack size is only uh, is only twenty thousand. So in this case, 
I think going on, it's a bit big. So, you know, so the thing is, if you're gonna re-raise, it's the same principle again, where if you're, if the amount you re-raise to is sort of like more than a quarter of your stack, which sort of means you're sort of committed and you can't escape, um, then you might as well just go all in yourself. So I'd say in this hand, if you had like less than 18,000, I would, I would just go all in, because you can't really escape. Um, even in this specific case where you have 20,000, I don't think it's terrible to just go all in instead of making it only 5,000, because it's pretty hard to fold a hand as good as ace-king, even if you make it 5,000, and then he goes all in for 20,000. So, but I think 20,000 is enough that you can make it 5,000, and you know, you can do this with your good hands, you can also do this with your bad hands sometimes as a bluff to balance it out, and you can fold, you do have a bluff and he goes all in. So, so yes, yeah, so that's roughly the sizing you want to make it pre-flop. And, okay, and another thing I want to say is, why is calling a pre-flop raise okay? So I, so I said in the first class, if no one has entered the pot and you're just attacking the blinds, you always want to raise. Um, you always want to raise to give yourself a chance to win the blinds for free. You don't want the blinds to be able to see the flop for free. But if someone has already raised, I think it's okay to call. I mean, a hand like ace-king is sort of too good, but if you had ace-jack suited or ace-queen suited, I think like just calling is fine. Um, so why is this? Um, so it's because the reason why in the first case you, there's no real advantage to uh, not raising, like just calling, is because the big blind, if the big blind has a good hand, they can still raise anyway. So it doesn't matter. But in this case, there is a huge incentive to not re-raise, right? What is the huge incentive here? It's, uh, so let me go back here. What's the huge incentive to just call for 2,000 instead of make it 5,000? Is if you make 5,000, if you make it 5,000, then you give him the option to go all in, right? This is a huge difference. In the, in the case where you're just raising the big blind, they can't go all in. But here you're giving him an option. So that's why you just want to call sometimes, so that they can't have the option of going all in. Okay. So this is a good example. So it's uh, so this is now a different scenario, but it's very deep. The blinds are only 2550, and players have like 8,000, which is, I guess, 160 big blinds. Um, and here, calling is definitely a positive expectancy play because you're in position, it's very, very deep, there's a lot of money still to play for, and you're in position for all the rest of the hand, which is great. Um, this is a good play. Um, so if you raise in this spot, it could lead to disaster, right? So what, what happens here is you raise, and then now hijack minus one, the guy who originally raised, they now have an option to re-raise again, which is what they do. And now it's just terrible. We basically have to fold. We could call if we're feeling lucky, but um, I, we basically have to fold. And I, I mean, I think calling is actually in reality a reasonable play, but basically it's a much worse situation than this one where we just called. Um, so yeah, that's a demonstration. So if someone's already raised, you can just call. I'm gonna talk more about this next class as well, like a, a pre-flop strategy against someone who's already raised, but that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, another thing I want to go through quickly is how to deal with callers. So I've said that you should never be just calling the pot when the pot hasn't been raised, but people will inevitably make this mistake. And usually if someone, you know, if it's full to do someone, no one's entered the pot yet and someone just calls, we call the term in poker is a limper, which is a bit of a derogatory term. Um, poker actually has a lot of derogatory terms, which is a bit unfortunate, but I sort of have the tough uh, decision of, you know, either you making up my own terminology, but then if you like go into the poker world, no one understands what you're saying, or I use the same terminology, which is derogatory, but, um, okay, so we're just going to call them limpers, um, either way, so you, so you need to be prepared and raise their lumps, but you do need to change your raise size if there's limpers. So, so let's say normally when it's deep, uh, you decide to raise three big blinds. Which is, which is fine. I mean, I said raise to 2.25, but I think it's fine if you raise to 3. It doesn't matter that much when it's deep. Like, you can raise to 3 to play bigger pots. But if there's a lot of limpers ahead, then you want to make it more than 3. Because, you're, because there's already money in the pot. So if you only raise it to 3, you're actually giving them too good of odds to call. So let's say in this case, I only make it 3. If I only make it 150, then, um, you know, by the time it's folded to the last guy, their odds of calling are going to be, they have to put in 100 into a pot 
of 375. Right, so that's like 3.75 to 1 odds. So that, that's too good. So roughly the, the odds, the rule is take whatever size you were going to raise to and then add a big blind for each limper. This essentially makes it so that the odds are the same as before. So in this case, if you were, you were going to make it 3, I would make it 3 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 because there's 3 limpers. Okay, um, and, and of course, like, you know, if you only have 15 big blinds, then in this case, instead of raising it to six big blinds, you might as well just go all in, right? The, the fact that you only raise to six big blinds instead of going all in is predicated on you having at least, like, 25 to start the hand, or something where it's enough to escape if, uh, if they go, if something weird happens after. Okay, uh, I'm going to finish off sort of showing you some more simple preflop situations. I think, uh, so the theme of this class is sort of, you know, being boring. Oh, I'm sorry about the slide. Uh, uh, so being boring, being simple, just playing on simple probabilities and uh, using calculators is, you know, can get you very far in poker. And, you know, I, I will go through, you know, crazy bluffs and exciting hand reads and stuff like that as well. But this class, I sort of wanted to stress the simple things that I think are good. Um, so, okay. So, so, you know, here, this is a situation. Uh, so here, uh, you have four three suited. I'm, uh, you're, you're too scared to go all in. Can I raise to two big blinds as an alternative? Oh, so you're the button. Okay, so the button only has eight big blinds. They started the hand with 1,600, and um, they, they make it 400 with only 1,200 behind. So I want to show you why this can go wrong. Okay, why is it bad if you don't follow the all-in rule? Because now, let's say the big blind has four three suited. Well, if you went all-in for eight big blinds, they'd have to fold their four high. But, um, yeah, okay, I'm not going to run through the calculation again. But the problem is now, if you only make it two big blinds, they can actually call your small raise with four three suited. And they have 4.5 to 1 odds, and that's definitely good enough odds for them. So... <coughs> So essentially, um, so if our hand has 40% equity against his range, range then it's going to be plus EV. So essentially, they're going to call. Um, and they're not going to raise the 4-3 suited. So basically, they, so the fact that we didn't go all in gives them an option here. With their good hands, they can go all in and rope us into getting all in anyway when we're the button. And with their bad hands, like 4-3 suited, that they don't want to go all in with, they can still call and see a flop. But the point is, we're essentially, so yeah, this is essentially their strategy. You can read it. I'm not going to read through the slide now. But um, the point is, we're giving them an opportunity to make a better play than they otherwise could have. If we just went all in, the choice is theirs. They either call or they fold. But here, they essentially, they can take their best hands that they want to get it all in with and go all in, and we call. Or with their, with their worst hands, like 4-3 suited, that can still call to see a flop, they can call and see a flop. And we're just letting them realize a lot more equity than we need to. So, you know, so, okay, let's say, okay, fine. If you want to get around that, you can make it 800. And, you know, if we make it 800, it's, it's more or less equivalent. So if they were going to fold, then they, they were still going to fold. If they were going to re-raise on, then we're still going to call. And then, you know, it's mostly equivalent. I'd say in this exact situation, making it, if you raise to 800, it's pretty much the same as making it 1600. But on some off chance, it's still possible you're giving them a free option. Like, you know, like maybe their better play with 4-3 suited is still to just call. And then if the flop comes really, really bad for them, like ace, ace, king. Maybe that's not even that bad, but like... Nine, eight, seven, or something. I don't know. Um, they could, they could maybe fold. So, basically, I think just keeping it simple is good. And um, so one, okay. So one concept I'll finish on is there's this idea of. Um, okay, so I have talked about you know all this stuff I'm saying about letting them go all, uh, giving them the option is bad. But you know what if you think they're so stupid that if you give them the extra option they're actually going to make a mistake and and um, giving them strictly fewer options is actually um, is actually bad. You actually just want to give them more options even though it's free options because they might make a mistake. So um, okay so so this is slide singing from uh, from a while ago but Bill Chen sort of gave a very good theoretical example of this but uh, so Bill Chen he actually might give a guest lecture the last lecture we haven't decided yet but he might come and speak 
uh, to, for the last lecture of the class this year. He, he wrote the book called The Mathematics of Poker. He's one of the like world experts on sort of the math behind poker. He's a, like, he's a math PhD. He's currently a trader at Susquehanna International Group. Anyways, so, so yeah, this, this is what Bill Chen calls a sucker bet. And sort of when, when you see your opponent do this, you should almost be a bit offended. Like I sometimes, this occasionally, like very rarely happens, but when it does happen, like I'm, I'm sometimes very confused because my opponent shouldn't be doing this. So maybe they're, they're stupid and the, the, you know, they didn't go on because they're stupid and they're actually giving me a free option. But maybe I'm actually the stupid one. Maybe they think I'm so stupid that if they gave me the free option, I'm going to make a mistake. So, you know, so like if you do get in a situation like this, it's, it's actually sort of an interesting theoretical question, I think. Like if you're sitting in exactly big blind's shoes, you know, you saw, like let's say you know the button is a competent player too. This makes it worse, right? If you know the button is a competent player, then you're saying, uh, I guess this sort of this sort of reveals what they think of me. If they're giving me a free option to see the flop here with four three suited, they must think I'm going to mess it up so bad that they'd rather give me this free option than not. Um, but yeah, but it's an interesting concept to think about, and sometimes it does happen. Another sort of example of a sucker bet is, uh, I guess I was talking about last class on the flop or even on the turn or whatever. You never really want to like bet. A very small fraction of the pot. Like if the pot is a hundred, and then your opponent checks to you, and you bet a dollar and do a hundred, you know it doesn't. It's not a real bet. It's one dollar and do a hundred. It's essentially an epsilon bet. It's essentially a zero bet. But what does it do? It gives your opponent a free option, right? Now they can check raise you. Like if they now it's saying, okay, I bet a dollar. Now you have a second chance to bet on the flop, right? You you check the flop, but I'm gonna bet a dollar and do a hundred. And now if you want to make it fifty. You can you can re-raise my one dollar bet to fifty, and now if you want, you can. And if you think your opponent's gonna make a mistake, you can try to do this. It is, it is a very specific exploitative strategy, but it's interesting in that it's so obvious as an exploitative strategy. So, anyways, okay, I, I think it's I think it's an interesting uh, theoretical thing. Okay, yeah. So I, I guess okay. So I think one, a few more examples. So once again, you know, these are all simple hands, but I just wanted to show you. I just wanted to show you. There's the only way you can mess up this hand is by not going all in. You only have 15 big blinds. Someone's already raised a lot. You know, you don't really want to try to do something cute like slow playing, especially you know if you had aces, maybe slow playing is okay. But with just ace king, any hand is so much equity against you, and you know you just want to go all in. Uh, here's an example where. Is someone, uh, someone in the late position raises and you have a pocket pair, you can go all in and this is pretty good because you do pretty well against their range that calls you. Um, yeah, so so this is this is a pretty good play often. I'll talk more about this in future classes, but if you're defending your blinds, often with small pairs, re-raising all in, even if it's for a lot of bets, is a reasonable play. Because you, because the hand they might even fold pocket threes pocket fours I think it's it's quite likely um I, I think yeah I think the Nash equilibrium is to fold pocket threes pocket fours if you have enough chips but when they do call you even if they have a hand like Ace King you still have fifty percent equity right so small pairs are pretty good at just re-raising all in against late position steals uh, yeah so all in here is good. And yeah, so okay, so the last example is also easy. It's essentially saying, so under the gun raises, hijack minus one calls, you have a great hand on the button and only 20 big blinds. You know, you just go all in. There's no reason to be cute and make it like 8,000. Unless, I guess, unless you were trying to sucker your opponent. Um, and yeah, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop here. And then, so next class, I'm gonna maybe, I'll maybe run through a tournament history next class. Like, I'll show you guys a history of me playing a tournament and try to discuss some of those decisions. That'll be one of the next, the next few classes. Alright, cool. Thank you.